Marcus Aurelius' nickname? And why was it such a slap in the face to his brother? And how can an upcoming graphic novel teach you about the Roman Emperor's life and Stoic philosophy at the same time? Hello, this is Anya Leonard, founder and director of Classical Wisdom. You are listening to Classical Wisdom Speaks, a podcast dedicated to bringing ancient wisdom to modern minds. Today I'm talking with Donald Robertson, a cognitive behavioral psychotherapist, trainer, and writer, as well as one of the founding members of the nonprofit group Modern Stoicism. He's the author of six books on philosophy and psychotherapy, including Stoicism and the Art of Happiness, How to Think Like a Roman Emperor, and his latest graphic novel on Marcus Aurelius, of which we will be speaking about today. But before we begin, a quick thank you to our Classical Wisdom Society members who make this podcast possible. If you would like to become a society member and help support the classics, please go to classicalwisdom.com and click start here. Now, on to the famous Stoic philosopher king. Okay, so you know when you're doing a philosophical debate, the first thing you need to do is like define your terms and say, okay, this is, what do we mean by this word? And you spend most of the time talking about that. But as somebody who's extremely dyslexic, when I talk to people, one of the first things I like to do is define how to pronounce the words. Uh, And so you've just written this excellent graphic novel, but maybe before we even get started, how do we pronounce it? For Um, I'm reliably informed by my good friend who's a classics scholar and a Latin teacher. My, my I don't know much Latin, my, my slightly better at Greek is my thing, but I'm reliably informed it's pronounced Verissimus. Verissimus. Yeah, I always think it's good everybody knows how to say it and then they're more likely to say it. So when they're talking about their friends and they read this great naf- graphic novel, they can be like, yes, it was Verissimus. Well, also, I think if it's difficult to pronounce, it makes people think about it for a bit longer, and then maybe it sticks to them allowed to remember it. Like, it gives them something to chew over. Also, I think I've got a monopoly on that word now on Google search results and Twitter and things like that, because hardly anybody else uses it. So why <laughs> Ver- Verissimus in the first place then? So, because uh, I know it, it's about Marcus Aurelius, so everybody mm-hmm. knows Marcus Aurelius, that's the one, but Ver- Verissimus is not uh, usually the first thing that pops to mind when they think of Marcus. Mm-hmm. Verissimus, get it right, Anya. I know, like, I know, I'm trying so hard. <laughs> tongue twister. Like, so, well, because it, so it was like his nickname, right? And uh, I, I wrote a prose biography about Marcus recently, and I put a lot more emphasis. I thought it was going to be hard to write a prose biography. I'm off at a tangent now, but it, it, it all makes sense in a moment. Don't worry. I'll come back around to the graphic novel. I wrote a prose biography on Marcus for Yale University Press. And I thought, geez, it's going to be tricky because there's loads of biographies of him. And then once I started writing it, I thought, oh, just I tend to find that I naturally end up writing different stuff. So I I focused a lot on his mother. And I I found that I couldn't avoid but say a lot more about Hadrian, who is his adoptive grandfather. And then in retrospect, I think it's kind of like strange that the other biographies don't dwell as much on his relationship with Hadrian because I think it's quite formative. But Hadrian gave him this nickname, Verissimus. And so it says something about the relationship, but it's quite cryptic because we're not told exactly why he called him that. It's a play on words because Marcus Aurelius was born. So confusingly, Roman emperors, Romans have confusing names, right? But Roman emperors in particular tend to change their name and stuff. So Roman, Marcus Aurelius was born Marcus Annius Verus. And uh, Verus is his family name. Um, it means true uh, and uh, or loyal, it can also mean. And so Hadrian was making this play on words. He said, he was saying, you're not only true, you're the truest. But we're not really told by the biographer exactly why he thought that was, he implies it's got something to do with Marcus's character. Even as a young boy, he got this, and he doesn't tell us exactly the age, but it was, it seems to have been round about when he was like six, seven, eight, roughly. So he's quite a small child. And Hadrian said, I'm going to call you the truest of all, which I think like, as an aside, here's a tip for people reading classics, I reckon, like, um, I think the, the Romans were much more adept, and they, the Greeks as well, at uh, uh, rhetoric than we are, right? And so the some of the subtle nuances of their conversation is kind of lost on us. 
But one of the simplest things that they do, I think that's sometimes lost in modern readers, is that often Roman authors, and I guess Greek authors as well, uh, when they're praising somebody, they're often, it seems to me that they're often implicitly criticizing someone else. Ooh. And the, 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 you can have I like it. <laughs> fun in games trying to figure out who they're slagging off when they're praising somebody. Um, so an obvious one is if you praise the current emperor, implicitly, are you, people are going to go, well, so if you say the current, the new emperor is incredibly just and benevolent. So of course you're going to think, well, does that mean that the last one wasn't? <laughs> like, are you kind of having, once you get into specifics as well, you're really kind of like having a dig at his predecessor. So when Hadrian calls Marcus Verissimus, we have to think, is he kind of implying that the other members of his family aren't as truthful as Marcus? Because they're called Verus. Like, he's got an upgrade to his name. Yeah, he's you the Verus so of the Verus, yeah. He's, praising he's very him, Verus. But kind of putting them down or something. Like, but then even weirder, Marcus, when he's acclaimed emperor, adopted his, um, had an adoptive brother that he made his co-emperor. So for the first time, there were two Roman emperors ruling at the same time. And he gave his adoptive brother, just to really confuse things, he, he gave his adoptive brother the, the family name Verus, and he had him, uh, Marcus had him marry his daughter. So by giving him his name, it kind of looked like he was adopting him. So a lot of people thought, it now looks like this dude's more like your son or your son-in-law rather than your brother. It's kind of confusing, the Roman families are confusing. But it also meant you've got two emperors, and one of them is called True, and the other is called Truist. Oh. But surely, like, yeah, like, it seems like Dumb and Dumber or something. Like, it's kind of, it seems like an implicit put down of the other guy. How could it not be perceived as kind of that he was uh, second rate or something? Not quite as true as Marcus. He's even truer. So that's where the name comes from. And, we, you know, our, our sources are sometimes a bit flaky. To put it mildly, as you as you may know, particularly the Historia Augusta, which tells us about this, but we, we're also told by other sources that Marcus got this nickname. And then there's a one source, Justin Marta, Christian author. We have a, his a address, a speech to Marcus, where he addresses him as Verissimus the philosopher. So we know that even in adult life, people this must have been a widely known nickname, and people actually addressed him by it as, a, as if it were a title. And it seems to be associated with him being a philosopher, at least in adult life as well. So it was a nickname from childhood that appears to have stuck with him. And also another author tells us that his favorite son, who he appointed Caesar uh, alongside Commodus, the bad one, uh, was called Marcus Annius Verus and Marcus nicknamed his, his son Verissimus as well. So that's everything that we know about that name. But it's interesting because I would say that one of the major themes of the meditations of Marcus Aurelius is the concept of truth and what truth really means. But also more than that, not just kind of like Marcus is more of a practical philosopher. So he's not only talking and thinking about what the nature of truth is and the way that Socrates or Plato might, but Marcus is more thinking about his relationship with truth. And you could say, and in fact, at one point, Marcus actually seems to explicitly say that, that truth is kind of an object of religion for him. He kind of, Stoicism in a way can be seen, some people compare it to religion, I would say it's a little bit different, but the Stoic philosophy could be seen as almost like a religion that worships truth. Mm, I like that. You know, I'm wondering about like more modern equivalents. And I wonder if it's sort of like Abraham Lincoln was often called Honest Abe or something like that. You know, that they kind of have a, a nickname. I, I don't think any politician now has a nickname regarding truth and honesty. But back in the day, at least, it seemed. <laughs> not that I can, but yeah, they tend to have all sorts of nicknames. Yeah, not so good. <laughs> well, it wouldn't, they, that's not what his nickname would be on Twitter. No. Why, no. If he was around today, people would end up calling him something else. Do you think that when Marcus Aurelius came to power, he sort of encouraged almost like a change in religion or culture with regards to Stoicism? Um, we don't have a lot of information. We've got little bits of information about that. So it seems that philosophy became trendy under Marcus Aurelius. It's implied in Historia Augusta, I think, again. Um, 
but we're not that which isn't kind of so you'd think if the emperor is famous there are some people that have some academics that have even questioned whether marcus was literally a stoic or whether he was known as a philosopher and i actually think that's crazy and i'm i'm kind of happy to stick my neck out in that regard now having written three books in a row about the guy and spent years so like i think it's pretty clear in our sources that marcus was famous as a philosopher during his lifetime and uh, he was, everyone knew he was a Stoic. There was, I don't think there was any question about that. People sometimes note that he doesn't, he only uses the word Stoicism once in the meditations and he doesn't refer to himself as a Stoic. But I think that's a bizarre thing to say because it's his private journal. So why would he stop in the middle of it and yeah. go, I am a Stoic, right? He's, it would be, why would he write that? Like he assumes that he's a Stoic, like, and he uses Stoic terminology and so on. But uh, so Stoicism, I think, became trendy. And certainly there were several senior uh, Roman statesmen at the time who were also famously Stoic. So the urban prefect under Marcus, which is like the kind of like the mayor of Rome, like the, the statesman that's in charge of the city of Rome, it's one of the most senior positions. Junius Rusticus was Marcus's Stoic teacher. So he would, it's not only that the emperor was a famous Stoic, the guy in charge of like, the kind of governor or mayor of, of Rome, the urban prefect was also a famous Stoic at the same time. So Stoicism was rampant uh, for a little while and trendy. And uh, did it change the view of religion uh, extant at the time? I don't, um, Marcus was like, a, like, I think like some other Stoics, he was kind of tolerant of Pagan religion is very different from uh, the Judeo-Christian religions, pa pagan, um, the, the Greek and Roman religion, in that the faith doesn't really figure in it in the, the same way, and there's more emphasis on the external rituals um, and the ceremonies that are associated with it and this, the mythology and so on. So it's possible for several people to observe the rites of different pagan religions but maybe to have very different beliefs and feelings and sentiments about what it all means. Um, Stoics in particular have a kind of philosophy of religion. So the Stoics were known for viewing religious myths as metaphors, um, which seems not a radical idea to us, but it was in some ways a radical idea in the ancient world. And so, so on the one hand, Marcus really respected and, that, and seems actually to be fascinated by uh, ancient religious ceremonies and rituals. He was a high priest of the Roman religion, right? He was Pontifex Maximus, like the Pope of uh, the pagan religion. He took it very seriously. Um, but he probably uh, thought that Zeus and the other gods were kind of metaphors for different aspects of nature uh, as a whole. And he, he probably believed in more of a philosopher's God, a slightly more kind of abstract uh, concept of God. Yeah, we've had a few articles over the years about how Stoicism has influenced Christianity, and um, there, there's a lot to be said. But we could, I feel like, go on a completely different tangent. I, I, just, well, I just want to give you a bit of trivia about that. Which yeah, is the, yeah, yeah. Not, not a lot of people know this, but the Stoics are in the Bible. Are they? Did you know the Stoics are in the Bible, Anya? No, I didn't. Uh, oh, in I the Acts of the Apostles. You've been, have you been to the Areopagus, I think, okay. have you? And at uh, the foot of the Acropolis. Yes, so there's yes, a big yes. rock called the Areopagus, mm -hmm. uh, or the, uh, the Rock of Aries or whatever. And people used to give speeches there. And the Apostle Paul goes there and the Acts of the Apostles and speaks to Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. And he quotes a couple of lines from a guy called Aratus, who was a student of Zeno, the founder of Stoicism. So not only does he talk to a bunch of Stoics, but he quotes some Stoic literature uh, to them. So they're in the Bible. Wow, that's amazing. Okay, everyone, we're going to have a quiz at the end of this. And uh, <laughs> why don't you remember where it was in the Bible? Yeah, everywhere. I, yeah, that's great. Um, now, you just mentioned that you've written three books uh, on Marcus Aurelius. And so now you've changed mediums. Yeah, well, and, yeah. And I don't know how many times you've referenced him as well on top of that. But so you've changed mediums from sort of prose to a graphic novel. What made mm -hmm. you want to make that change? And like, is there an advantage of, or is it just a new way to view a topic? Well, it was kind of uh, a happy accident or whatever. I, kind of, I sort of stumbled into it in a way. It wasn't my intention to, to write a graphic novel. 
but uh, the opportunity arose and like an illustrator got in touch with me and uh, I, I had this idea of doing little web comics, partly as a kind of promotional thing for courses that I ran. And then cut a long story short, an editor saw them and uh, I got in a conversation with some publishers about whether we could make a graphic novel and then I sort of got into it and we signed a contract and we did a graphic novel. At no point did anyone ever ask me, Anya, have I ever read a graphic novel? <laughs> like, and I, I, I hadn't read many, like, but um, luckily when I was a teenager, I read a lot. Of, I read this comic called 2000 AD, it's a British comic, Judge Dredd is in it. And it was kind of a little bit more adult. So it's very similar in some ways to, to graphic novels. And which tend, tend basically like big comics, but are often like a little bit more mature um, in, in their content. Um, and also I, I realized there are lots of books that tell you how to write graphic novels. So I read a whole bunch of books multiple times about the art of writing uh, graphic novels. So I learned a lot. I had a crash course and I learned very quickly. And I worked uh, with some more experienced people and I did a graphic novel. And it's like, I realized quickly that it's, well, actually, there's different ways of doing it. You could have a graphic novel, Anya, that's just a bunch of matchstick men, like, and it's just what I would call a dialogue dump. So you could write a load of dialogue and give it to an illustrator, and they just draw a bunch of talking heads doing it, right? And there are very successful graphic novels that look like that. However, nobody told me that. Like, <laughs> so I went into it thinking, ah, oh, geez, I guess, like, you know, there needs to be lots of action and stuff. And so I watched loads of movies. I watched every Saws and Sandals movie I could think of and TV shows and I studied them and stuff. And uh, I constructed it like a movie. So potentially doing a graphic novel script is like writing a, a movie screenplay or a, a storyboard for a movie, basically. Right down to you'll describe the, uh, the shots, like, you know, low angle, medium close up shot you know, and, and stuff like over-the-shoulder shot, like cowboy shot, like use the similar terminolo terminology, potentially in the, to the what you would use describing a, a screenplay for a, a movie. And, uh, and I thought, I don't want this book to be like two guys in sandals talking a lot, because that would be kind of like defeat the purpose in a way, right? So I thought I spent a lot of time, a huge amount of time and effort trying to intertwine philosophical concepts and dialogue with action that was occurring. And so we know a lot about Marcus Aurelius's life. So it was easy actually to tell a story where there's a lot of action involved in some really graphic imagery and stuff. And that if you look closely, Marcus makes it hard for us because in the meditations, he, he, he actually talks in a strangely abstract way Right. Some people call that book a diary. I wouldn't call it a diary because it's not like he's it's not obvious he's writing it on a sort of daily basis, recording the events of the day. Maybe a journal of, sort of like a workbook or something would be a slightly better term. Um, but he uh, he says, for example, the most famous passage in the meditations is 2.1. And he says every morning when you wake up, uh, tell yourself that you're going to meet envious and jealous and meddling people and then go on and prepare yourself philosophically to deal with them, right? But he doesn't say who these people are, right? So if we think about Marcus as a real historical individual, we'd naturally go, who are these meddling, treacherous, petty people that he's getting ready to meet each morning? I mean, he's talking in general, but he also must be thinking about specific people that he's actually met the day before or is going to meet later on the same day, right? Um, but he, never, he very seldom names people in that regard. He's usually talking in more abstract terms, which is interesting from a literary point of view because it means that as readers, we find it easier to project ourselves into what he's saying. We imagine that he's talking about people in our lives. But we do, we gain something and we lose something. It makes it better as a self-help book because it's easier for us to immerse ourselves in the techniques, but it's it's less helpful as a piece of, as a historical document um, because it's hard for us to then connect these sentiments to, he, he faced a number of huge, he faced a civil war, for example, and several huge betrayals. 
So when he says to himself, wake up each morning and tell yourself you're going to meet treacherous people, like he, at some level, does he have in mind some of the famous individuals, the world histor historic betrayals that took place during his reign, such as the rebellion of Avidius Cassius, for example? Like he, he mentions the he lived during a plague, a pandemic similar to, you know, like, uh, the one that we're living through, but much, much worse. Yeah. And uh, much worse, yeah. far worse, like... And far more graphic and visual as well. We don't really see COVID, but um, the, the people in the Roman Empire were being carried out of Rome by the cartload and they were dying in the streets and stuff like that. So it went on for a long time, or even long, even longer. It went on for like 10 or 15 years or something like that. Oof. So we think we've got it bad. Like, but also you'd walk down the street and there'd be people kind of like, you know, deformed and dying and, uh, you know, like uh, also even people supposedly smelled of the plague. Like, so it was more in your face kind of plague that went on for a much longer period of time. But he doesn't mention it, except very briefly and, and somewhat dismissively in the meditations. But then in the other passages, like maybe he's referring to it indirectly. So I tried really hard to think, can we connect the things that he's saying to some of the historical events? So at the very least, could we say like when he was faced with a big betrayal, can we imagine that the general things he said about betrayal would have been similar to what he was actually thinking when he was faced with a real one and so on? And sometimes he'll make these little allusions like he'll talk about, uh, he'll use things as a metaphor for, for philosophy, like the gladiatorial contests or the beast fighters, or seeing little birds on the banks of the Danube and things like that. So there are ways that we could kind of build that into a scene where he's actually experiencing those things and maybe having similar reflections on his uh, real world experiences. So it, it lent itself to a very visual kind of epic story because the plague is visual. They, there are huge battles in it, like a lot of uh, big battles. There's a lot of intrigue and very colorful characters. And then what well, adds another dimension to it as well, I, it didn't occur to me to do this at first, but the, you might ask me, has it changed some of the, the way that I would tell the story or, or think about his life? And I suppose when we're, well, first of all, one thing I would say, uh, the one of the main things I noticed is when we're writing a prose history, We'll say the plague broke out and round about like 166 AD. Um, and then we'll say, and this continued for a long time. And then we'll go on and talk about the other events of his life, like the wars that he fought and so on. But then we kind of, because we're telling the story in a prose uh, form, we, we'll kind of forget that we mentioned that there's still an ongoing plague, if that makes sense, right? Yeah, yeah. Unless you keep bringing it up. It yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. But when you visualize it, you go, no, there's still loads of people dying in the streets and stuff, right? So it's you, you're more confronted with the fact that the plague continued throughout all the other events that happened. So you do perceive the story somewhat differently. Um, and that's just one little example. But another one is that the Roman histories often report dreams, for example, like, and funnily enough, when we are kind of analyzing the history, like typically historians won't, will talk about the dreams and they'll maybe have a little bash at doing some sort of cod Freudian psychoanalysis on them or whatever. But other than that, they don't really pay all that much attention to the significance of the dreams. But if you're doing um, sequential art, as it's somewhat pompously referred to like a <laughs> comic book or a graphic novel, then uh, the, the dreams actually become more part of the texture of the story and the information that they contain sort of becomes more relevant. So we're told that Hadrian dreamt that he was being attacked and consumed by a, a lion and it was a terrible nightmare and he woke up hemorrhaging from his nose and worried that he was going to die, right? So that's kind of a cool little story and then the historians will go, well, I wonder what this could have meant, yada, yada, yada. But when you see it, visually it, it gives you more of a sense of how disturbed Hadrian was and it's easier to kind of sense that this is the experience of a man who kind of feels whatever it whatever it means at some level this is obviously a guy who feels like things are closing in on him and that he's in danger and like even if we can't quite pin down the interpretation we get the general idea like that image remains with us and it then colors our perception of what follows in a, in a way that might be kind of difficult to articulate in words, but it, 
uh, and nevertheless, the, the image contributes something to our understanding. So the visual medium does, I think, uh, have potential to change our experience of the story. And, and it's interesting that the thing, one of the things that really stood out for me is the role that, that dreams play in telling the, this, the, these biographical stories. Oh, I think that's absolutely fantastic and really, really interesting. Also, because I guess when you're writing a biography or writing in the prose format, you know, often you're trying to be just as factual as you can, or, or you know, you're trying to be really like truthful to the exact story. But in a way, if you've got this sort of visual medium, part of it allows you to be more poetic. If you're trying to like sort of, in, instead of necessarily tell like the exact details of his life, try to explain some of the principles of the meditations through the actions yeah. of his life. Like, I love that marriage of the two. And I, I mean, I know like when I did the Sappho children's book, you know, I tell the story of Sappho, but I try to put the poetry yeah. and the original lines into it. So it's like kind of rounds out, you get the experience of reading the book and marrying it with the life of the person who wrote it. I think that that's definitely the way to do it. Like that makes it, you know, that, that's really, I think that's what it's all about. I mean, there's other ways of doing this, but what's really interesting is if you can marry these two things together, like the, the ideas. I said, look, very simply, for, first of all, as an aside, the, many people have read the meditations of Marcus Aurelius, but perhaps not uh, everybody that would be um, listening to this or watching it, but it's a very well-known book. But I'm surprised how many people think we don't know anything about Marcus Aurelius' life. So I should maybe just back up a little bit and say um, we know more about Marcus Aurelius than we do about maybe any other ancient philosopher. Um, certainly we know far more about him than we know about any other Stoic philosopher. Um, and people might say, well, how is that? And the answer to that is because he was a big deal back in the day, like, because he was a Roman emperor. Like, so there are statues of him, many statues of him. There are inscriptions about him. There are coins that comm commemorate events in his life. The, he's referenced by many other texts. We have at least three major sort of surviving Roman biographies of his reign. Um, in addition to that, we have a cache of his private letters. And we also, the least well-known source, but also kind of important, is we have Roman legal digests that record his edicts and like hundreds of them. Like, so we know about his legislative agenda to some extent. And that tells wow. us a lot about, about how his, maybe how his philosophy influences his politics. Um, so we know um, a lot about Marcus Aurelius. And so I, I came out at the beginning and thought, what do we have in the meditations? We have this kind of record of his internal journey. Like we, if you read the meditations, you would know very little about the guy's life. A little bit in the first chapter, he talks about his friends, but he mainly talks about their character rather than their actions. There's little tiny fleeting references, but like I say, it's kind of abstract in a sense. So we have this kind of record of his, like his stream of consciousness or like his thoughts and his, uh, his beliefs and so on. Like that's quite deep in depth. Like, so we know a lot about what this guy believes and the things he's wrestling with in his mind and so on. And then from the histories and the other evidence, we know quite a lot about his life and about his uh, career as, uh, as emperor, uh, his reign as emperor, if you like. And I thought, well, I want to marry these two things together. The internal story and the external st story are kind of usually treated separately. Like the biographers don't really say that much about how his philosophy influenced his decisions as emperor. And I wanted to try and intertwine the internal story that we get from the meditations with this external story that we get from the, the Roman histories. That was quite hard, but like I put, uh, you know, worked on it for two or three years and, you know, it's too late to change it now. Like it's out there. I saw the review copies have just gone out to people, um, oh. but I'm, I'm, pr I'm pretty happy with it because we put a huge amount of work into it. And I'm proud to say we had consultants that advised us on language and on the historical details, but the Roman armor and weapons and things like that, um, right down to you know arguing about changing the length of the swords that the legionaries were using, and <laughs> kind of like looking into getting the fission. Man, it was so much hard work. Like it's, the, in the prose biography, you don't have to worry about details like that. But when you're drawing it, you're like, well, like you're never going to get it totally accurate. But we tried as hard as we could to get the visual details, the landscapes accurate. So as part of that, 
I mean, I'm lucky that I spend a lot of time in Greece anyway. So there are some scenes that are in parts of Greece that I, I could draw on my experience for. Um, but I also went to Carnuntum in Austria for a week and I interviewed the CEO of the archaeological site there and the director of archaeology as well. And uh, we took a lot of photographs and shot some film as part of the research for all of these books, really, so that I could see the landscape and look at the archaeology and see, you know, even what sort of wildlife would have been around Marcus. So that's where Marcus was in this Roman legionary fort fortress on the banks of the Danube, where he wrote probably most of the meditations, or at least part of it. He, he mentions, he, there's a page where he just says at the top, in Carnuntum. Yeah. That's how we know. He says yeah, yeah. so. Why? And there's other bits of evidence that we, we know. Like the coolest bit of evidence, and one of the most recent, is that the archaeologists, I asked the director of archaeology, is there anything that you guys have dug up, you know, that actually tells us much about Marcus Aurelius' life? And that's quite a tall order. But they found the gravestone of a Praetorian um, soldier, legionary, um, from 171 AD. Now, that means that it was almost certainly, because those were the emperor's personal bodyguard, if you like. Um, so Marcus must have been there in that year if one of his Praetorian guard died there. Like, so that's quite a cool little piece of like hard evidence, literally engraved in stone, that allows us to, to date something. So he says in the book he was there, but he doesn't say when. And this dated stone gives us a clue what year he was actually there. I love it yeah. when the textual evidence joins up with the archaeological evidence. Yeah, you have to really be like a, like almost scientific, like a murder mystery researcher yeah. to kind of like figure out the clues and everything. Um, and it's really handy that you have so much information then to to find so all much time details. on my hands i thought you were going to say it's, it's so much well, time on my hands. no it is funny though i think the first <laughs> time we spoke you mentioned working on this and that was years ago yeah, so years ago. I, yeah. It's a, well i got really? a shock because i was interviewing the illustrator for a new york times best-selling graphic novel called logic comics which people may or may not know it's a, a graphic novel about the history of Western, uh, modern Western philosophy of language like Wittgenstein and Frege and Bertrand Russell and these guys, right? And it was a bestseller. And so I spoke to the illustrator who worked on it and we were just kind of like chatting. And in the middle of the conversation, he just mentioned in passing that they'd be, they worked on it for like six or seven years. So when I started, I assumed it was going to take me a year uh, to do the graphic novel. It took us two or three years in the end. Like, but I'm glad it didn't take six or seven years. But before that, I'd been researching this subject for decades. And I, I, in some ways, I think it's one of the unfortunate things about being a writer is that people kind of like ask you then to keep writing about the same subject sometimes. So I've written at least three, but I've written three books and then chapters for several other books, all about Marcus Aurelius and about his life and stuff. But in the course of doing that, it means at least that I've been able to really immerse myself in the subject. And altogether, I've been studying Marx and Lewis maybe for about 20 years and Stoicism before I even you know, like got started in writing these books. And now I'm ready to write about something else, I think. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I've started You're all writing Marcus out. <laughs> the mark is coming out of my ears. Yeah, yeah. Like, You've messed out looking, on Marcus. Start looking like him. Like, yeah, yeah, go around talking like him. <laughs> Yeah, that would be awesome. Why not? I mean, you could do worse if you're good, you know. Like, do you know? Funnily, no one ever asked me this, right? But do you know who I think he looks like? Who? Exactly. Yeah. Doctor Who. The Tom which Baker. Doctor? Which, yeah, yeah. Which which when doctor I was who? when I was growing up, Tom Baker. I still think is probably the best Doctor Who. I I'm think Tom Baker right when when he grows a beard. Well, like if you look up Tom Baker with a beard, Tom like Baker. Tom Baker when he was younger and he had a beard, to my mind, looks quite a lot like Marcus Aurelius. Hey, Tom Baker is still around. He's quite, I think he, you know, he's uh, getting on a little bit now. He's going back a ways. So I don't think he could play Marcus Aurelius anymore, but he could have. I wish he had when he was younger because he looked like him. You think, okay, I mean, I don't know if I can see that. Is like that one? That, that's one. Yeah, that's not the best one, but that's not bad. He looks a bit like Marcus Aurelius there. Oh, There's another yeah, yeah. one where oh, it looks oh, even oh, more oh. like him. That oh. is Marcus Aurelius. Yeah. That looks a lot like Marcus Aurelius, apart from the teeth. Yeah, not the teeth. 
Oh, this is a good challenge. You know, I got to say, like, that would be, it's always a fun game to play. And we're like, who would play whom? Like, if you even did a biography of your life, who's going to play you? You know, like, that's always, uh, you always yeah. got to think of your, your, your. Well, celebrity. actually, do you know who could play Marcus Willis now is Russell Crowe, ironically. Like, they should do a prequel to Gladiator and then, like, you know, maybe that'd be too weird. But Russell Crowe Crow is starting to look more like Marcus Aurelius as he gets older, I think. Mm. Oh, I'll have to do some more internet yeah. sleuthing to figure out. They're, they're, who currently I'd working on, they're currently working on the sequel to Gladiator. That'll be fun. Yeah. So most people, when they hear that, go, well, how can he dies at the end, right? But the, the, the idea is that it follows... Uh, I think the story of uh, his, uh, not his child, but uh, is it Lucilla's son, uh, Marcus Aurelius, his grandson in the movie, who's called Lucius. He's the little kid called Lucius. I think the idea is that it follows his story, but I assume, I'm guessing, that it would have flashbacks or whatever, or some sort of reference to the, the previous movie. Like, so I, I would think it would have to have some kind of references to Marcus Aurelius in it. It'd be cool. Here's another little, little we're, do, we're, into, we're doing showbiz gossip now. Did you know that that's what you're doing on your channel? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I did. We're mutating into showbiz gossip. <laughs> but I heard, but showbiz gossip about the classics, right? I heard that um, Russell Crowe is really quite into Marcus Aurelius. And when they were making the original Gladiator movie, he was kind of pushing to have more of the meditations incorporated into Gladiator. Like, um, and there's like one or two sort of vague references. Well, maybe we should get Marcus Oscar. Aurelius, I mean, Marcus Aurelius, Russell Crowe <laughs> yeah. on the show to yeah, talk about Marcus Aurelius. Yeah, that's a great like, idea. You know, what could have been like, but maybe in the sequel, there could be more references to, to Stoicism. If there was, if there was a philosopher king, why can't there be a philosopher actor? And what's his name? Um, John Malkovich is supposedly working on a film about Seneca, another famous stoic. Cool. Now, I was going to actually, this does actually dovetail to my next question, which is, do you think that by creating a graphic novel instead of a prose biography, that mm -hmm. you can reach new audiences and, and introduce stoicism and, and Marcus Aurelius to people who might not have had exposure otherwise? Well, that what. That wasn't my plan, right? But then we know, we, we know we've established already that I didn't have a plan. Like I just kind of stumbled into things. But I think people, I, funnily enough, I, I keep saying I, I have no idea and I never really approached it like that. But people keep telling me that they think it appeals to a different audience. Now, I think some people assume because it's a graphic novel, it's aimed at kids, right? Well, I don't like, it may be slightly more original. You know, there's quite a lot, of, there's a bit of crucifixion and torture and death and stuff like that. And some pretty hardcore philosophy about our own mortality and stuff. So it's, it's probably not for tweenies, like, but maybe kind of like older adolescents or whatever might, might get into it. So it is a little bit more mature in terms of the, the themes. Um, like I say, like, but nevertheless, it's, it still may appeal to a slightly younger demographic, perhaps, or a slightly different demographic than the usual um philosophy books or self-help books based on stoicism well and i think like just having things in different mediums can appeal to different people who just like to learn understand things and i mean yeah. i was just actually thinking it's funny like i grew up in a very comics loving family you know sunday comics it was you know the tradition everybody read the comics every morning and i always loved calvin and hobbes mm -hmm. and it's I don't know if you've ever read Calvin and Hobbes. It's, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's for younger kids. I mean, Calvin is little. I mean, but uh -huh. the funny thing is, is it's deeply philosophical. Uh, I mean, it's even referencing philosophers in the name. Uh, and it, it's, it's, they bring up yeah. philosophical points beautifully all the time. So it's, uh, it is a really nice way for the visual learners of the world to uh, enjoy something in a more relaxing way or just just in a different way. I've seen an excerpt from it that illustrates and talks about a concept that we use in cognitive therapy. And it's derived from a, an obscure quasi philosophical mid 20th century movement okay. founded by a guy called Alfred Kozybski, who's a Polish immigrant to the US. And it's known as the movement was known as general semantics and it influenced science fiction authors, weirdly, and cognitive therapists. And the idea that they're referring to in the Calvin and Hobbes cartoon is verbification, 
like, which is the idea that you would take nouns and turn them into verbs. Um, and I think one of the characters in it says verbification weirds language. Like, so it's using the word <laughs> yes. weird adjective uh, as a, or adjectives and nouns, like using the adjective as a, a verb. And we use that in therapy. And the most famous, we use it in many ways, but there's one really famous example in cognitive therapy, which is that if someone says, this is a catastrophe, um, the therapist might teach them to think of uh, as uh, something that they're actively construing as a catastrophe. So they'd say, uh, is it a catastrophe or are you catastrophizing it? Like, so we turn it into a verb, we verbify it in order to take, get people to view it more as an active process that they're engaged in uh, of judging it as catastrophic. We, uh, we actually have a, a like, cute little wine bar that's not too far away from our house and they have kind of large pores. And this, I know this isn't to the Stoic uh, audience specifically, but it, the, re, the place is called Boule. And so we say, if somebody's gone there and they come out a bit tipsy, they've been Vouled. They've been Vouled. Yeah, been fair we're going wine. to Vouled. Yeah, so it's a part of the parlance of the local expat scene in Buenos Aires, it's if fun. anybody wants some inside knowledge. <laughs> um, but I did want to ask too about stoicism in general because uh mm -hmm. you know you you've been mentioning all these actors and there's movies and things like that so um it and to kind of bring it back full circle to, to marcus aurelius's own time stoicism became trendy so it does seem like stoicism is trendy now and that there's like yeah. youtubers who talk about it um what do you make of this sort of growing trend i think uh, ancient greco-roman philosophy is the future and love that. Uh, love that. Can I make that my like new quote? From yeah. This? <laughs> yeah. The, so yes, yeah, so it's weird. Well, I I feel awful about say I'm awfulizing it, like. But I I sound like like one of these hipsters or whatever. It says I was into this band before it was cool, but when I got into stoicism, people still thought it was a really obscure, like it was it was the school of ancient philosophy that nobody studied. Like when you do a philosophy degree, I studied Plato and Aristotle at university as part of my philosophy degree, but we wouldn't study the Stoics. Because, and I asked my friends who are academic philosophers why that's the case. And they said, well, look, the Stoics just take some of the best concepts from Plato and Aristotle and Socrates and earlier thinkers. And then all they do is work out the practical application of them in daily life. Like in order to improve their well-being and happiness. So why, why would anybody want to study that? Is what the academics used to say to me. Like so, they I thought, but that's exactly why everybody wants to study it. Like, but modern day academic philosophers traditionally weren't interested in the practical application as much of these ideas, and that's what the Stoics specialised in. So they were kind of left by the wayside. But it, it's that's kind of been handed over to the self-help industry and to psychotherapists. So that's why we've got this weird kind of crossover. So Stoics weren't studied. I only really properly began studying them as a, a postgraduate student. And, uh, and then to my shock, uh, this kind of really obscure subject, niche subject, suddenly started to become trendy. Bill Irvine brought, uh, uh, that was one of the first ones, A Guide to the Good Life. And then Ryan Holiday's books came out. And then other people started to write about stoicism and Tim Ferriss and guys like celebrities started to, to talk about stoicism. I would never in my wildest dreams have imagined when I was uh, doing my master's degree um, and getting into stoicism that one day, you know, you, you'd have people talking about it all over the internet and, you know, celebrities and sports personalities getting involved with it and stuff like that. So we're kind of used to that now, but it, it was, wasn't that long ago that that was unthinkable. Yeah, it's really, it's really changed even just like since I first started Classical Wisdom. I mean, I remember I started Classical Wisdom around the same time Ryan Holiday started Daily Stoic and we were writing back and forth about doing stuff. And now like Daily Stoic's very well known. I mean, it's 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 amazing to see this trajectory. Um, yeah, Daily Stoic's huge. It's like a multi-million copy, you know, best-selling, you know, publishing phenomenon, uh, really. And uh, yeah, Stoic. I mean, it's lucky for me because you know uh, I happen to be writing books. So I never uh, imagined that the books that I wrote about would be, uh, you know, 
that widely read. And I think of that as a bit of a fluke because they, how to think of the Roman Emperor has been translated into 18 languages. Like, so I would never have dreamt that people in Japan would be reading Korea or whatever in Persian and like, you know, like there's a Croatian translation like that just seems like un would have awesome. seemed unthinkable to me. It's awesome. And, you know, people ask me why. I'll give you my very rapid fire answer to that because I'll just tell you what people tell me. So over the years, I've worked with thousands and thousands of people that are interested in stoicism on at conferences and things like that. And so they, they tend to say that they see stoicism as a kind of Western alternative to Buddhism and yoga. So it's more consistent with our cultural norms and values of the, from the West. They see it as a secular alternative to Christianity, although it was religious, but it's also a philosophy. So people who are atheists or agnostic don't seem to be more comfortable with it. They see it as like cognitive therapy, but bigger in scope. That's what attracted me to it. For cognitive therapy is tends to be short term and uh, problem focused or solution focused. It, it doesn't uh, provide a, a way of life or an entire, you know, a whole philosophy of life. It's stoicism like CBT, but bigger in that regard. And they say it's like academic philosophy, as I was referencing a moment ago, but more practical like, and more usable in, in daily life. So those are the things that people tell me that they get from stoicism. And there's, like, there's probably other reasons why it's become popular as well. One of them, I think, is the rise of the sophist, maybe. Like, so in, in the ancient world, like you could argue that Socrates appeared as a kind of uh, uh, a countermeasure. Like Socrates evolved. Certainly, you couldn't. I don't think you could have had Socrates if you didn't have the Sophists. So those were these kind of early quasi philosophers or orators, and uh, they taught about virtue. They were kind of like self improvement gurus. And Socrates defined himself to a large extent in contrast to them. And the Stoics are part of that same Socratic tradition, also defining themselves in contrast to rhetoric and sophistry and stuff like that. And I think we're seeing a resurgence in uh, sophistry, in a sense, on social media. Um, and so, you know, Stoicism, to some extent, evolves naturally as a kind of countermeasure to that. Mm, yeah. So as... As we are entering into a more and more world filled with, you know, the fake news and the, all this kind of muck and things, people are actively seeking out a way to find virtue and truth. That's like that. the fake, there's the fake news. There's just the way that social media works. The sophists would compete with each other, like literally you'd win a goal or something or, or money if you gave the best speech, right? So it's literally a popularity contest. Like, and so Socrates said, well, the problem with that is that you guys end up saying stuff that you don't even believe yourselves, because you just say whatever is going to get the best reaction out of the audience. And that's a dangerous path to go down, my friend, said Socrates, you're sacrificing truth and reason in favor of persuasion and appearance, doing things for appearances sake. You know, it's all style over substance kind of thing. That's a dangerous uh, road to go down. But Facebook will show you stuff depending on how much you engage with it or how many likes it gets and stuff. So social media does the same thing. We get more of something if people engage with it, like regardless of whether it's actually true or not, like, you know, because it, you pay more attention to things that are evoke fear and anger and strong emotions. So there's more av marketing, advertising revenue, potentially the companies can make out of it. So you create this monster, like this machine that is designed just to upset us and tell us stuff that isn't necessarily true just because it gets us all worked up. And, you know, it's not a healthy situation. But also I'd add to that, that we see the rise of individual people who are doing similar things on social media, journalists and self-improvement gurus and social media influencers in general that don't fall into those conventional categories, who I think also just say whatever the audience react to because that gets them more views on social media and they make more money out of it. And, uh, you know, so we, we end up with it falling into the same trap that the sophists fell into in the ancient world. Like, and, you know, at some point we need to learn to step back from that and actually question things and think more critically. I concur completely. And I think it's, uh, it's tragic that, I mean, everybody knows it too, and yet still kind of needs constant reminding. And so maybe that's uh, your an excellent point about 
that stoicism is a, is a way of thinking, is a lifestyle that, and you, I know you've said to me in the past, it's a bit stickier than just like, you know, certain other uh, practices. So it, it, it hopefully is a counterbalance. And uh, just to, to finish up, because I know uh, you've already used up quite a lot of your time. So I want to ask one last question, if I may, that, um, you know, I often like to say stoicism is sort of like the gateway drug uh, into ancient philosophy and, and maybe the classics in general. Uh, and I like to think that Marcus Aurelius is sort of the gateway drug into Stoicism. Uh, mm -hmm. And he's often the first uh, person that, that people kind of counteract as a personality. Yeah. So after, you know, learning about Marcus Aurelius, reading your graphic novel, your prose, who do you think should be the next person people read? Well, I get asked this question a lot. So I've got a pretty cut and dried answer to it. So the major, not everyone follows the same path, first of all. That aside, this is what usually happens. Most people do read Marcus Aurelius first, right? And then the next thing I would suggest that they read is Epictetus. Yes, yeah. Because Marcus Aurelius refers a lot to Epictetus, and he was mainly following Epictetus. And we have two main things from Epictetus. We have the discourses of Epictetus, and then we have the Enchiridion or Handbook. Well, the Enchiridion or Handbook is a summary that's meant to be easy to read. So, of course, read the Enchiridion next. And if you really like it, then read the discourses. And if you want something else, read Seneca next, uh, the letters to Lucilius. They're quite long. There's over 100 of them. Um, but they're pretty easy to read. Um, and so, you know, usually people would start with that and then maybe look at Seneca's other uh, letters, so-called letters. They're really more like essays. And then if you like that, there's also some lectures by Masonius Rufus is very similar to Epictetus. And then there's many, many other types. Cicero is an important source for Stoicism. Cicero, not a Stoic, but sympathetic to Stoicism, well-educated in it, drew on it heavily and wrote about it extensively. So sometimes Cicero is for, you know, forgotten. He requires a kind of honorary, observes a, an honorary mention as uh, not a Stoic, but one of our main sources for Stoicism, nevertheless. In particular, De Finibus. Um, is uh, one of uh, his texts that are most relevant to understanding Stoicism. Yeah, and I always like telling people, you know, whenever you're reading different philosophies and stuff, like you don't have to necessarily take everything and be like, okay, I'm a Stoic now, I must take cold showers and eat soup every day, like, you know, to be, yeah. <laughs> take the most superficial elements I'm of- Literally um, making soup right now. <laughs> yeah, I actually, you know, okay, I. I should say one thing. So and I had a cold shower this morning, Anya. Yeah. Well, <laughs> was that by choice? No, I, well, it was by <laughs> choice. I do normally have a cold shower, but I find in, in Greece, it's not too bad. But in Michigan and in Nova Scotia and stuff, when it's kind of like ice cold outside, it's a bit of a different story. You know, we, it's more of like an ice cold shower. We ran your um, stoic food essay recipe uh -huh. in our last uh, December magazine dedicated to stoicism. Um, and uh, so this last couple of weeks, I was in a cabin down in Patagonia up in the mountains uh, in Villa de los Angostura, and we booked really late. So there was like not many options. And so we had this cabin and it, we didn't have any hot water and it was like one room and I got a big pot and I made that stoic soup and I felt so stoic. And it was like, you know, it's kind of Emerson, Thoreau-esque, you know, there was like three chairs, that's it. There's three of us, you know, I was like, okay, good. This is how I recharge. Lentil soup is, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's healthy. It's good for you. I love it. Okay. It's interesting well, what ancient philosophers ate. Pythagoreans apparently ate honeycombs. Why? So they all, they, all, they all had that kind of like weird dietary preference. But no fava beans. They wouldn't touch the fava, we wouldn't even touch a fava bean. Never. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm gonna, end it. I'm gonna end us on that wonderful note. Uh, when's, your, when's your graphic novel out? Um, it, if I remember rightly, it's out in June. And so also, so the rest of the graphic novels out in June from St. Martin's. And around the same time, I think, maybe a little bit later, the Marcus Aurelius Ancient Lives, the biography that I've written for Yale should also be coming out. Wonderful, double whammy. Mm. <laughs>